12.29 p.m. A motorcade escorting the presidential car, which the then U.S. President John Fitzgerald Kennedy is sitting in, turns right into Houston Street, entering the Daly Plaza. It slowly approaches the Texas School Depository Building. A large crowd is standing on the streets, watching as the president goes by. Little do they know that in the Depository Building, high school dropout and former resident of the Soviet Union Lee Harvey Oswald is waiting by one of the windows. In his hand is an M9138 bolt-action rifle, also known as an Italian Carcano. 12.30 p.m. The motorcade turns onto Elm Street. In a split second, three rifle shots are heard in the distance. All three of these shots are aimed at the president. The first bullet lodges itself in Kennedy's back. The second one misses Kennedy and hits Texas Governor John Connolly instead, while the third one misses completely and bounces off the pavement. The crowd descends into a state of confusion and panic, while Kennedy's incapacitated body is whisked away to the nearby Parkland Memorial Hospital. By 12.33 p.m., Lee Harvey, believing he had successfully killed the President of the United States, had already fled the depository building. 12.40 p.m. The first news reports begin coming in, with Walter Cronkite declaring on CBS that something terrible had happened to the President in Dallas. The news stations don't specify his health status until 12.45, when they declare that he is in an unconscious state. Meanwhile, Catholic priests wait outside the hospital with bated breath, preparing to perform the last rites on a potentially dead president. 1 p.m. The doctors who treated Kennedy come out with news. President Kennedy is in fact alive, but temporarily incapacitated. Governor John Connolly is also alive and being treated. Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson takes up office as U.S. President until Kennedy recovers. 1.44 p.m. Lee Harvey Oswald is found hiding at the Texas Movie Theater and, after assaulting the police officer in an attempt to kill him, is arrested and dragged out. November 25, 1963. Both John F. Kennedy and John Connolly recover from their wounds and leave Parkland Hospital. Not long after this, President Kennedy tours Dallas before announcing his candidacy for the 1964 presidential elections. February 20th, 1964. Lee Harvey Oswald is taken to a Texas state court. His lawyers try to get him an insanity plea, but due to his communist stance, this fails. With no appeals, Oswald is quickly found guilty and sentenced to death for the attempted murder of the president. He is executed four days later. This execution does not help to alleviate Cold War tensions. U.S. relations with the USSR and Cuba worsen significantly due to Oswald's alleged Marxist views. On top of this, McCarthyism makes a short comeback. With this new opposition, the counterculture movement is snuffed out in its roots before it can properly gain traction. As the last year of his first term begins, Kennedy is reinvigorated. In early 1964, a new wave of legislation is pushed through Congress, encouraging many reforms including the expansion of financial opportunities and an increase in net gain for the poor and unemployed. These new acts would become the beginning of what would be later called the War on Poverty. JFK also tries to get the Civil Rights Act passed, but is hindered by large Republican opposition and lack of experience with Congress. During this delay, race relations take a hit, and riots would increase across the country, particularly in the southern states. Throughout early to mid-1964, President Kennedy sends federal troops to the south in order to maintain the peace as he tries to ease Congress into signing the CRA. It wouldn't be until 1967 when the Civil Rights Act is finally passed. November of 1964 rolls around. Nearly one year after the failed assassination attempt on President Kennedy, Republican Barry Goldwater is placed up to run against him in the presidential election. The election season becomes really heated, and in the midst of it, JFK makes the controversial decision to drop his Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson as his running mate, instead replacing him with the more liberal North Carolina Democrat, Kerry Sanford. This angers many Southern Democrats, as well as LBJ, who begins his own faction within the Democratic Party. In the final election results, however, JFK manages to defeat Goldwater, winning a second term. This causes the Republicans to become really bitter, and throughout his second term, President Kennedy has to deal with them trying to introduce anti-immigration legislation against Eastern Europeans, as well as their constant refusal to accept most of Kennedy's policies. 
As the 60s progresses, the Vietnam War becomes an increasingly big topic in American debate. During his first term, President Kennedy slowly became more opposed to it. By 1964, there's only around 100,000 U.S. troops in Vietnam, and soon a slow withdrawal of U.S. troops begins, reducing American support for the South to aid and advisors. JFK also encourages the foundation of the United Nations Vietnam Combat Force in order to make the war more of an international issue rather than just an American issue. These plans ultimately fail, and the Vietnam War ends in a northern victory in 1967. On the bright side, the money saved from the Vietnam War is used to drive the ongoing space program. In 1965, JFK begins investing much more into NASA, and very quickly the Soviet program falls behind. The moon race ends with American astronaut Michael Collins becoming the first man on the lunar surface in September of 1967. This boosts American morale, introducing a new space culture in the U.S., which quickly replaces the hippie movement. The Kennedy administration soon begins optimistically promising a new era of unprecedented progress in America, using the media to encourage this view. People of America, today our brave scientists are leading the quest across the cosmos. We need your support to fuel this journey. Be a pioneer and donate to NASA today. Even one dollar can bring us closer to new horizons as we discover the mysteries of the universe. Make your contribution now. Contrary to the views of Congress, funding for the space program skyrockets and science-related subjects are promoted more in schools. All of this progress surprises the Soviets, who begin making attempts to boost their own rocket technology. Due to technical issues, these attempts would fail. Over the years, America's space program would continue to advance until 1971, when NASA finally lands a base on the moon, naming it Plymouth. After eight years in office, Kennedy's presidency would come to an end. However, he would still continue to observe minor operations in places like NASA. However, throughout the late 1960s and early 70s, Kennedy's health deteriorated due to his Addison's disease. This illness was kept largely on the low from the public, but eventually became hard to hide. The disease would cause him to die in 1973, at the age of 56. In the 1968 Democratic primaries, two candidates stand out, them being Robert F. Kennedy, the brother of JFK, and Lyndon B. Johnson, JFK's former VP. Both candidates were from different parts of the party's political spectrum. In the end, RFK is chosen as the Democratic nominee. The Republicans, meanwhile, nominate Nelson Rockefeller. With the country having just come out of an arguably source of successful administration under Kennedy, RFK wins narrowly, becoming the 36th U.S. President in 1969. Under his administration, RFK calls for expansions to the Plymouth Colony, with further lunar exploration continuing into 1972. In time, many countries begin seeking to compete with the Americans in space, and throughout the late 70s and the 1980s, the nations of China, the Soviet Union, India, as well as many European countries begin working towards bases of their own. With this success, RFK is re-elected in 1972. By 1976, the Democrats had been in the White House for nearly 16 years, and the Republican Party started to look for new people to bring an end to the so-called Kennedy dynasty. They would eventually settle on a charismatic Californian politician and former actor named Ronald Reagan. Reagan's political views lead him to gain a lot of popularity, and he wins the 1976 election with ease, defeating Terry Sanford. Reagan would go on to serve two terms. In 1984, the Democrat Walter Mondale would defeat Richard Schweiker, becoming the 37th president. He'd only serve one term before handing the reins over to George H.W. Bush in 1988. After him would come Bill Clinton in 1992, who would serve two full terms. Meanwhile, the internet rises and America is taken into the 21st century, a time of exponential technological advancement and heightened space exploration. In hindsight, modern day views on JFK's presidency are pretty mixed, with many people calling him a compromiser who is beneficial for America in the long run, and many others calling him a disease-ridden commie lover who is, quote, too soft on Vietnam. People often still wonder what would have happened if Kennedy's controversial presidency was cut short by that one deranged man in Texas back in 1963. What if he had succeeded in his attempts to kill the president? I mean, all it took was for that one bullet to not miss, and we could have potentially lived in a very different world. Food for thought. 
Anyway, thank you all for watching. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and let me know in the comments what other scenarios I should do in the future. See ya!